Life Audio. This is going to be all of us, whether it doesn't, it doesn't say anything in Revelation about the best singer. It says they sang a new song. It's every single one of us. And so even now, I, I believe that every person is a worshiper, no matter where you stand in the room on a Sunday morning. Greetings, dear listeners, and welcome to a new episode of The Walk. I'm delighted to introduce today's guest. Emily Lindquist is a dedicated worship pastor serving at Church of the City in New York. In this episode, she shares how her deep dive into the book of Revelation has transformed her understanding of worship. Rather than focusing on individual leadership, Revelation depicts worship as a unified chorus centered around Jesus. Emily also opens up about her experiences in their New York prayer room. But first, I want to quickly share about our exciting new partnership with Q Streaming. So they're a First Amendment committed platform offering access to thousands of live TV channels, movies, and series for just $59.99 a month. Okay, so check this out. This includes all your favorite sports, right? NFL, golf, baseball, all local broadcasts. So if you want to switch between, you know, San Francisco, NBC, and the Giants, and NBC, Chicago, and the Bears, you've got it. So you'll also get ESPN, Fox, CNN, and all the cable channels, so you can get all messed up on fake news. Qstreaming works on most devices, phones and tablets, computers, and connected TVs, so you can enjoy live TV, on-demand movies, sports, pay-per-view, and global channels with no contracts or hidden fees, all for $59.99 a month. So that's a pretty sweet deal. And the best part is when you sign up, you're supporting Worship Leader Magazine. So... Again, the link's in the episode description or in the show notes. Also, our partner Planning Center invites you to streamline your church administration with ease. From scheduling volunteers to managing giving, Planning Center offers powerful tools to keep your ministry organized and thriving. So be sure you check them out at planningcenter.com today. That's planningcenter.com. Okay, here's Emily Lindquist. Hey everyone, so great to be with you. Uh, my name is Emily Lindquist, um, and I am just grateful to, to jump on and share a little bit about what God's been putting on my heart. I am currently a worship pastor uh, here in New York City at Church of the City, and I grew up worship leading. Uh, I started really young, I think in fifth grade, leading for third graders, which I'm sure did not sound good, but someone decided to throw me in, and I'm so thankful for that opportunity and just continued leading as I grew up and just got older and older and have continued to be in worship ministry and now get to do it for with all of my time, which I love so much. We have had this term worship leader for a while now, and I have felt this tension personally. I'm wondering if it's something that you've ever felt before. How do I worship and lead at the same time? It is often difficult to hold two things in tension, and they are two different actions with two different focuses, worshiping and leading. To, your attention's going to two different places. And so I have struggled with where does my attention go? Should it be in the room? Is it my encounter with the Lord? Is it somehow it's both? And I have been spending a lot of time in the book of Revelation, and that has helped me so much with this question of how do you do both of these things. As a worship leader, I love this book because it gives us a glimpse of what we will spend eternity doing, which is worshiping Jesus. And it also gives us a reality to anchor to right now. I used to, growing up, I heard the book of Revelation kind of shared as this far off, distant thing that one day will happen and it was kind of weird and we didn't really talk about it. But Revelation is actually a book for us right here and right now because it is a right now reality. Jesus is sitting on the throne in heaven and worship is happening around the throne. And so when we worship on this side of heaven, we're basically taking an anchor and throwing it into the reality of heaven and saying, Right now, things might be turbulent, but we're, we're saying and we're declaring that our ultimate and final reality is what's actually happening in heaven right now. And so when we lead people in worship, we can actually join in what's happening around the throne and saying, hey, it, le- it might look difficult and bad here right now, but 
this is our truest reality, and that's what we actually get to invite people into in worship. And so as I've been reading and studying, I've noticed something in Revelation. Most of the language that's used talking about the worship in heaven is a unified voice of a group. Revelation 4, 8 says day and night, they never stopped saying. Revelation 5, 8 to 10 says they sang a new song. Revelation 7, 10 to 11 says they cried out in a loud voice. Revelation 14, 3, this great choir sang a wonderful new song in front of the throne of God. Revelation 15, 3, and they were singing the song of Moses. So there's not necessarily a structure about which worship leader is starting the song. It's just kind of, they sang. That's, that's all the language we see in Revelation. And it all seems to be unified around Jesus rather than sparked by a specific voice. And what I, what I think it is and what I love about this picture is that it's a response to the lamb who's seated on the throne. And I'd love to share just how that has impacted how I lead and that tension of worshiping and leading. I get to be a part of a church with a prayer room that meets every day to worship and pray um, for a couple of hours throughout the day. And this space has taught me so, so much about worship leading. The prayer room is a bit of a quieter place. Sometimes there's two people in it and sometimes there's a hundred people in it, but it's much more unplanned than a Sunday. Um, sometimes there's only a handful of people there. And so it really gives you space to just sit with the Lord and not feel rushed, uh, which I think is, is such an important thing for worship leaders is to take time to just sit with the Lord unplanned, not in a set and build that relationship and build that deep well with the Lord. And it stretches me as a leader in ways that, that a planned Sunday service might not. So a couple of years ago, I was leading in the prayer room and I usually pick a song to start and just kind of like play whatever else comes to mind for the rest of the 30 to 40 minutes. And we were singing a really simple song and I wasn't totally sure where to go next. And I just remember thinking, I just want to do what the room needs. What does the room need? Where do we need to go? What is the next song? What is the next chorus? Is there a scripture? Is there a word? What does the room need? And, and of course, there isn't anything wrong with caring about what God is doing in the room and wanting to steward that. But I was so focused on doing what the room needed that I lost sight of what I was actually doing, which is worshiping. And so I closed my eyes and just tried to listen. And what I heard in my mind, which I believe was the Holy Spirit, just said, Emily, just look at me. What if you just closed your eyes and worshiped? And, and that sounds unbelievably simple and almost silly. Worship while you worship lead. But it was a groundbreaking moment for me that I didn't have to have the exact right chorus. I just needed to get my eyes onto the one that I was worshiping. And that was actually what the room needed. And the room didn't have this monumental shift, but something did shift because I felt like I knew where I could go after that. It just felt like the pressure wasn't on me to come up with something for the room. I was able to just look at, the, at, at Jesus and go from there. And our first role is to minister to Jesus and worship him and trust that the Holy Spirit is working in people's hearts. That doesn't exclude our participation and the Lord may give us specific words or directions to help minister to the people in the room. And, and of course we can use our skill as a vehicle. Skill is wonderful, but ultimately the pressure is not on me. It's not on the worship leader for transformation in the room. 2 Corinthians 3.18 talks about being transformed as we behold the beauty and the glory of the Lord. And so that's where transformation actually happens is when we help people look at the beauty of the Lord. We'll be right back with more from Emily. It also doesn't mean that our worship can't be prepared or planned or excellent. Of course not, but... 
it does redefine, I think, our role as worship leaders, that we don't have to whip something up in the room or have the perfect thing for people. Our, our first role is actually just to prepare our heart and, and develop intimacy with the Lord and minister to Jesus. And then everything else flows from that. Even if it's not, I found in worship sets that if I come from having time with the Lord all week, even if it's not exactly what we're singing about, I find that I can still lead from a better place because my heart is alive for Jesus and not just how I want this set to go. Another scripture I love is Revelation 8, 3 through 5. And it says, Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. And what I love about that scripture is that it says that the fire of the altar is what fuels what's happening here on earth. Our prayers and our praises go up and are met with the fire from heaven and get hurled back down to earth with power. And so our worship and praise get met with the power of God. In that prayer room set, I was really holding on so tightly to figure out how I could lead the room well. And when I finally stopped trying to figure out what the room needed and just worshiped Jesus as if I was really looking at him, I was able to lead the room better. And so we continued singing that same song for several more minutes. And I felt like God just wanted us to remain there. And the simplicity of us, we were just singing, Jesus, we love you. But in my attempt to get the room to go somewhere, I could have actually missed out on being aware of who God is and that we were even singing to God because I wanted to make sure I did the right thing so badly. For some reason, I grew up with this idea that worship leading was not your time to worship, but to serve, and they were mutually exclusive. And while there's truth to that, it is a time to serve, absolutely. It does not mean that worship should be excluded from the experience. I would actually say it's the foundation of the experience. And I think that subtle instruction has crept in and kind of disconnected us with the Lord when we lead sometimes. It, it almost dis disintegrates our walks with the Lord from our times of serving. When we're focused more on what the room needs than starting with our own fascination with the Lord, we end up losing on both sides. It gets our eyes off God and onto our feelings and what we think we can get going in the room. Jumping back to the unified voices in Revelation, what I find so freeing about this language is that the goal is for the bride of Christ to worship and look at Jesus because at the end of the day, the lamb is the leader. The lamb is the one inspiring worship, not what I can whip up in a set. So our our role is so simple and, you know, it's simple, but it's hard. It, it is to spend time outside of leading, becoming fascinated with the lamb and just get our eyes onto him. The Lamb of God is what's stirring up worship in Revelation. The Lamb is the leader, so the weight is not on you to create worship. Your role is just to look at the Lamb and point others to Him. There's that kind of phenomenon where if you point somewhere and look somewhere, if you're walking on the street with a bunch of tourists or something and you point up, everyone's eyes follow wherever you're pointing. And I think worship is the same way. It, we're just trying to point to the one who's seated on the throne. Fascination with the Lord doesn't just happen in a set. Um, this happens in our in our quiet time of prep preparation with the Lord. I think it's so important to be spending time outside of leading with Him, developing a deep well to pull from and to to lead from. And it's great to prepare a tight musical set. Yes, practice, be skilled. We want to be able to get our eyes off of our hands. But what is better is spending a disproportionate amount of time with the Lord to stir your own heart. I would like to just invite you to think about a couple questions. Have you ever had a moment of frustration 
because a set isn't going well or the response in the room isn't what you want it to be? Do you feel like you have to make it hit every time you lead a set? Do you feel the pressure of a set going somewhere and someone coming coming up and saying, wow, my heart was so moved? Um, do you feel that that weight on your shoulders? And then finally, how do you prepare your heart for a set? I want to encourage you that the Holy Spirit is the one who does the work in the room. When God shows up, we can ask and we can worship and we can praise. But when he does show up, he does what he wants. And we want to be yielded to that, but it's not something we have to figure out on our own. It's better for us just to behold the Lord and come in total desperation for his spirit to move. So my last few questions are, uh, what is burning on your heart? What word are you bringing into Sunday? Not because you have to be on or because you have to have something to give the team, but because you love the Lord and you've been spending time with him. It doesn't even have to fit perfectly into the songs that you're going to lead. It's just, what is the Lord teaching you right now? What are you fascinated about the Lord? What what aspect of the Lord are you fascinated with? What are you thinking about? What are you asking him? What are you wondering? So if you're feeling tired or worn out of leading, I just encourage you to spend less time preparing maybe the perfect set or the perfect transitions and more time in prayer and worship at home on your own, just time before the Lord. That is how we develop fascination with him. You can, uh, we love to ask this question on our team. What is the Lord teaching you right now? What have you read this week? What are you loving about the Lord? Even if it's not perfectly fitting in with what you're going to sing this weekend, um, this is the place that we need to be spending time is in the secret place, uh, just worshiping the Lord. And that doesn't have to happen in a a perfect prayer room. It doesn't have to happen with an instrument even. It can happen with a, a background pad on your phone and you can worship and sing to the Lord. It doesn't even have to sound good. That's what's great about doing it in the secret place is no one else can hear you except the Lord. And, and if he can hear every one of our prayers, then he can hear every one of our voices and he loves them and there is space for your voice. So even if you are not a worship leader who can um, lead from a a vocal perspective. This is something that the Lord loves to hear. And and if you're not, uh, if you wouldn't even consider yourself a worship leader, I actually believe so strongly that this is for every single person. Our, Our eternal job, every single person is to be worshipers. This is going to be all of us, whether it doesn't, it doesn't say anything in Revelation about the best singer. It says they sang a new song. It's every single one of us. And so even now, I I believe that every person is a worshiper, no matter where you stand in the room on a Sunday morning. So even if you're in the middle of the congregation, the way that you worship the Lord can come from this, this secret hidden place of spending time with Him because he, he longs to hear the voice of the bride. He doesn't just long to hear the, the speaker on the stage. He doesn't just long to hear the worship leader with the best voice. He longs to hear from every single one of his children. So with that, I would just love to close out and pray uh, for, for you to develop that fascination with the Lord. God, we just praise you that you are the one seated on the throne God, thank you that you continually reveal yourself to us. There is always a new aspect of who you are. God, you, the depth of the riches, God, you are just full of something new. God, and we will, as we, as we change, God, you reveal yourself in different ways to us. And so there's always a new reason to worship you. Lord, I pray for those who may be tired or burnt out or tired of leading or tired of putting together sets or just feeling not the motive, just not having the motivation to even spend time with you. God, I ask that you would just refuel them this week, that they would, um, that the living word of God would just come alive in their hearts this week, um, that you would, that your Holy Spirit would just encounter people as they spend time in your word. Um, Lord, would you fuel them with fascination for who you are 
as they go and as they lead and as they worship in whatever space they are in, Lord, would you just fuel them with fascination for who you are? We love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Emily, for joining us on The Walk and for your passion for worship. We're going to play out this episode with a song from the recent Church of the City release called Christ is All. Before we go, we invite you to like and share this podcast. And if you feel prompted, consider subscribing and leaving us a review. It really means a lot. Thanks. Also, again, don't forget to check out Q Broadcast Streaming through the link in the show notes. Lastly, I want to extend my heartfelt gratitude to Life Audio for their invaluable partnership. I encourage you to visit lifeaudio.com where you can explore a diverse range of podcasts. Discover your next great listen at Life Audio. All right, I'm Joshua Swanson. It's been a real pleasure having you with us. Until we meet again, thanks for listening. Here's Christ is All from Church of the City, New York. Looking for what is mine before I give you yours You have always been and you will always be The center of all history May my name So may my name be known by only you Written on Life Audio.